I want to thank all of you for coming out to our project presentation today. Uh, it'll be about 30, 35 minutes. So hopefully you all can stay awake for that long. Uh, we are Tri-State Consultants. Our, our group consists of Derek Marucci, whose project tasks include foundation design, structural design, and stormwater management. Megan Zelis, in charge of stormwater management and site planning. Joe Castellanos, who took on the task of structural design loads, structural design, and the windows operator. And myself, Travis McDaniel, I took on the structural design loads, structural design, and the technical drafting. The scope of our project is a highly automated 815,000 square foot distribution center built for our client Family Dollar to service their suppliers in the Midwest region. Our distribution center is located east of I-69 and southwest of the crossing of County Road 31 and 800 South in Ashley, Indiana. Our project includes site development, and in site development we are including the subsurface exploration, the erosion control practices, the location of the inlets, manholes, water systems, and the grading. The structural design components and elements uh, were designed for structural design loads, joists, columns, framing system components, materials, loading bay, and the parking lot layout. Uh, we hope to inform you about how we made a decision on design for the superstructure and substructure. And we will start with Megan with the site development. Close projects, including our project, the Family Dollar Project, follow a step-by-step -step process. The first process in designing a project is site planning. There are two different components in site planning, pre-construction plans and post-construction plans. For example, for pre-construction plans, you can either evaluate existing contours, rows, stormwater management practices, and erosion control practices. The first step in our design process was to evaluate erosion control practices. Our first erosion control practice will be using a temporary gravel construction entrance and exit, which will allow the soil to not be able to escape from the property and get onto the existing county roads. The next, the next erosion control practices practice is using inlets that will surround, not using sill fences that will surround the entire property, which will help keep in sediments from escaping the property and help with erosion control. The last one will be, we will use is bales of hay that will be on top of the inlets. The, the next one we'll use is, we'll put bales of hay on top of the inlets, which will help collect any sediment that does escape the sill fences. The next process in our design was to evaluate existing contours. The existing contours were provided by DeKalb County Surveyor Brad Stump in which we were able to look at the existing contours and draw a ridge line down the middle and we split our property up into drainage one and drainage two, the north end and the south end. We were then able to take the existing contours and grade our, we were able to take the existing contours and grade our property based on which way we wanted the stormwater to go. And we were able to determine that we wanted two retention ponds, one for the north end and one for the south end. After the grading and inlet location design, we were then able to calculate pipe design. We were able to calculate pipe sizes. The pipe sizes were calculated using the rational method, Q equals CIA, in which we designed for a 10 year storm. And the areas were calculated each inlet had their own drainage area, so we were able to calculate the areas, and, and then we used the runoff coefficients 
based off of asphalt, concrete, and grass. We also use the time of concentration for each pipe, pipe networking system. After the pipe design, we were then able to do the retention pond design. And this is a basic retention pond, and you can see the normal pool of elevation, in which ours is going to be 984 for each pond. And then you can also see the spillway, which we're going to have a riser pipe structure with a trash rack to collect any sticks, trash, and that will go into our retention ponds. The first part of the retention pond design was to create a pre-development and flow hydrograph. The pre-development and flow hydrograph was determined based on the pre-development conditions that we provided by the DeKalb County Surveyor. The whole concept behind the pre-development inflow hydrograph curve is that the peak, the peak flow of the pre-development inflow hydrograph curve cannot exceed the post the post-development inflow peak hydrograph inflow hydrograph curve. This is a side view of our retention pond number one, in which you okay, there we go, in which you can see the inflow and. All of our pipes that are connecting to our retention ponds are going to come into about 983. And then we are going to have a riser pipe structure in which you can see right here. And the diameter of the retention pond one riser pipe structure is going to be about 5 feet. We are able to calculate the riser pipe structure based on the outflow hydrographs. As you can see here is a post development and full hydrograph curve for pond one versus the post-development hydrograph, hydrograph for outflow. And we were able to calculate the volume underneath the post-development inflow hydrograph curve to calculate the amount of volume that each pond needs to store. And here's another example for pond two. The time to peak, or the time and the flow rates were calculated using numerous equations based on drainage areas and runoff coefficients. The whole point of the outflow hydrograph curve is that the peak of the hyd outflow hydrograph curve cannot exceed the peak flow of the pre-development hydrograph curve, in which we are able to pull that off. And if it happened to, if the outflow peak of the hyd outflow hydrograph curve exceeded the pre-development one, then we would have to redesign our pond and increase our volume and our riser pipe structure. And here's an example of pond number two pre-development versus outflow. And here is one of our AutoCAD drawings showing the yellow lines are the gray lines, the orange lines are the drainage lines that we calculated, and then the red is our building, and then you have our parking lot and our main entrance, and then the front car parking lot, and then here's our two ponds. And Travis is going to talk about the structural design. All right, the structural design. The objective of our building is to maintain static equilibrium, so the forces and the moments equal zero. We want our loads to resist and also transfer the loads throughout the building. We also had to look at the deflections. We used ACI and AISC limitations for the deflections of our members in our structure. We designed the substructure and superstructure using ASCE 710 and IBC 2012. The substructure includes elements such as the footings, the foundation, and the soil. The superstructure contains all other structural elements above the surface. Using ASCE 710, we were able to go through the design loads. You have the design loads that we considered that govern our design are the dead loads, the roof live loads, the live loads, the snow loads, and the wind and seismic loads. The dead loads, roof live loads, and snow loads are all axial loads, which push down on top of the building, also known as gravity loads. And the wind and seismic loads are known as lateral forces, which will act into the building from its parallel side. Using ASCE 710, we 
use the simplified envelope procedure to calculate the wind loads. And then we compared that with the load analysis we obtained for the seismic loads using GIS software. And we're able to conclude that the wind load is going to govern over the seismic load in that region. So we designed for the wind loads in the simplified envelope procedure. And as you can see in our diagram, we took the wind loads and made it a distributed load against the longest horizontal direction of our building and then also the least horizontal direction of our building, case one and case A and case B. As you can see, the arrows here go in both directions. When you calculate wind loads, you have a wind acting against the wall, and that would be your windward direction, and then the side that the that is opposite of that would be your leeward direction. So you're going to have positive and negative pressures on your building. The side that your wind is pushing on is going to be your positive direction, and the other side of the wall is going to be your negative direction, which is like a suction. The wind loads also distribute on the roof system, which is also positive and negative. So you'll have forces pushing on the roof and also pulling on the roof. ASC 710 stipulates that if the suction forces on your roof are too great, you are able to negate them because if you think the wind isn't going to blow all the time, always the same, or in the same spot. So if your wind is going to blow and pull on your roof, that is actually going to help your design. Because if you're designing for a load pushing down and that wind is pulling up on it, you're going to have less load in your foundations. But since the wind isn't going to blow all the time and pull on your roof, you can't use that as a constituent to design less for your building. So our wind loads we use to determine our superstructure diaphragm. Now, I kind of like to explain a rigid and a flexural, flexural diaphragm in terms of a box. A rigid diaphragm, I would like to think of it more as like a wooden box that has all sides, all wooden. And if you push on one side of that box, your box is going to move with itself, but it's not going to deflect in any way because all of the sides are going to act <coughs> together and those forces are all going to distribute throughout the whole box. Now if you think of a flexural diaphragm system, I would like to think of that as more like a cardboard box. If you push on a cardboard box, your system components are going to act together, but you're still going to get deflection. So if you push on a cardboard box, it's still going to move, but if you push on a wooden uh, box, it's not, going to, it's not going to move over like a cardboard box would. And we designed our structure to be a rigid diaphragm system. Our diaphragm starts with our precast concrete walls. Our precast concrete walls are actually in panels. And for a diaphragm, what you have to understand is that your diaphragm wall, when you have a wind load or seismic load acting on your wall, that will distribute between the foundation and the roof. But to still look at the uh, components of the shear wall panels, we designated each panel to be 8 inches thick, 11 feet wide, and typically most of our panels were 20 feet high, but some of them varied with height. So like I said, each panel has to be calculated for the shear load at the base, the overturning moment, and also its sub-weight, the dead load. But on top of that, we took each panel and thought of it as a single wall unit. So if you add up all those panels on one side of the building, that is one diaphragm wall. And so we also had to calculate the diaphragm wall as its own separate identity. And that also needed to be found out the shear, the overturning moment, and also the diaphragm connection. So how it acts between the foundation and the roof. Using visual shear wall, 
which is almost like visual analysis. It's made by the same company, and the software is pretty much the same. We were able to take our calculated shear force in the base and the overturning moment and the dead load on our structure and input it into the software and get a finite nodal analysis. So here's a finite nodal analysis of our shear wall against just one wall. Our panels are not separated at this point. This is one solid wall. And at the bottom, you can see you have the shear, the dead load, and the overturning moment acting at the bottom and at the top. The next slide shows the diaphragm. And as you see, we this one in particular, it might be a little hard to see with the color there, but this is where we had our wind load acting. And all these nodes and all these points show how when the wind acts at that point, how that load is transferred throughout the whole diaphragm of the entire building. Because all of our wall pieces are connected together. Using this information, we were able to go to a supplier of precast concrete parts. And we picked high concrete group. Uh, they're in this area. They are easy access uh, to our site. So we picked them, and we were able to get pretty specific with what kind of wall that we wanted to pick. Uh, we used the, we picked the carbon cast insulated wall panels. Uh, this also leads to lead certification, uh, different lead certified things. We didn't go into the lead certification part, uh, but if someone was interested in that, that would have been a, a nice selection for them. You can see it can carry 7 to 12 inch thickness, which our nominal thickness was 8 inches. Um, I don't think it says on here, but uh, this wall in particular could also withstand 4 to 7 KSI concrete. Which, when we did our analysis on the visual shear analysis, we uh, stipulated that the concrete strength was 4 KSI. Um, we also were able to select uh, very detailed components. We could pick the color, we could pick the texture, and uh, the finish of our uh, shear walls. So we were, we decided to go with brown and sandblasted uh, shear walls from the high concrete group. Okay, about halfway there. Let's revisit the design modes. Once again, I'll try to stop the final modes. Uh, I want to briefly discuss dead loads, live, roof live loads, and snow loads that will also be applied to the structure. Dead loads are pretty much the permanent loads attached to the structure. And it's a pretty straightforward process to calculate the dead loads. You're pretty much adding the weights and materials as you go down. And uh, roof live loads were a thing from AC 710. There's a table that gives you uh, roof live loads for a particular, particular classification of a structure. So we got 20 PSF of roof live loads for our structure, and that accounts for construction loads, um, maintenance workers on top of the roof, etc. This slide gives you an illustration of the design process of snow loads. Um, when we're talking about snow loads, we, we need to consider balanced, unbalanced, and drifting loads. Um, let me define section one. We divided our uh, building up into four sections. Section one is the warehouse area. So when I make mention of section one, uh, I'm talking about the actual distribution center. So section one um, will not experience any loads due to drifting, uh, but the office area will. And the figure on the right shows geometric properties and, how, and what we use to calculate the drifting. Our structure will utilize a rigid frame multi span system um, due to the long spans, especially with section one, we'll have at most 165 foot spans. So we'll have two rows of columns going down the center of the structure. We'll be using 18 gauge roof deck and open web steel joist purlins and open web girders and we'll be also, also be using W-shaped steel columns. 
this is an illustration of the low path that our loads will take. Um, starting from the top down, we will have our loads or our design loads uh, distributed across the purlins from the decking. And then these purlins will collect these loads and then apply them as point loads on our girders. So putting the self weight of the purlins, we will design our girders and they will need to be deeper because they will be much longer spans. So we use SLH series joists for our girders, which are super long span joists. And these girders will apply point loads to our columns. So you can see right here we have a W12 by 72 column for section one, which is the largest shape we use. And then this column will distribute or apply a compressive load on our footings, which will then work to spread out the loads and distribute it to the soil, which is ultimately where we want our load destination. The Perlin design process is pretty straightforward. Um, we use AC 710, uh, section 2.3. There is a list of load combinations, I'm sure most of us are familiar with. And load combination three control for our design. So we plug in all of our design loads and it will give us one, uh, I'm sorry, we plug in all our service loads and it gives us one design load we use to design our structure. So this is how we get the 492 pounds per linear foot load demand. And Volcat will be supplying our um, steel joist products. So we looked in their catalog of products and we selected a K-series joist with a maximum capacity of 500 pounds, 505 pounds per linear foot. So our load capacity is greater than our load demand. Girder design follows the same approach. Our load demand will be greater to the self weight of the drones. And again, we use the product catalog to select SLA series towards, and our capacity was greater than our demand. All right, columns. Physically, what do we do to design our columns? Well, our primary mode of failure is buckling. So we want to design our column to remain stable when loads are applied to it. So basically what we do is we obtain our design load PU and there are different approaches we can take. We can um, pick a cross section that has sufficient moment of inertia to resist bending and sufficient area to decrease the compressive stresses in the column. We can also change the support conditions and we can also add bracing. Um, what we did was we used a steel construction manual provided by AISC and looked in the tables and we determined, uh, we selected a shape that will meet this load demand. For this particular PU, which is our demand, we selected a W12 by 72, and our capacity was greater than our demand. So this pretty much illustrates um, boiler theory that we use to design our columns, which takes into account slenderness and critical buckling levels, et cetera. Thank you, Joe. And for the foundation design, the first part of designing the foundations is we need to first analyze the soil and the existing subsurface conditions at the project site. Unfortunately for us, we were unable to get onto the project site before the construction and site development of the actual project had began, so we weren't able to get on the site to, to do our own soil borings and obtain our own soil samples. However, Clink, the, or the property's previous owner, had soil samples that they provided to us that we used to do our soil testing on. The soil tests that we performed are the average limits test and the sieve analysis. Using these two uh, tests and the results from these two tests, we use the unified soil classification system to classify the soil as a poorly graded sand with silt. Using the soil classification as well as U.S. Geological Survey maps, we 
created our own design soil boring to use. And we created several different layers of soil, and we created uh, the unit weights for each layer of soil, and then we used Dr. T's Big Bad Book of Soil Correlations to come up with the remaining properties of the soil layers in order to develop the design for the foundations. And this soil boring, uh, we believe, represents what you would find out there on the project site or in a region similar to this. The first part of the, of the foundation design consists of the concrete floor slab. The purpose of the concrete slab is to provide a solid surface for the distribution center operations. The two loads that we took into account or consideration for the concrete slab are your typical warehouse loads such as forklifts and pallet racking. We took the uh, ACI 360R manual and which provides several different methods for calculating the thickness and uh, reinforcement for concrete, concrete slabs. The method that we use is the Portland Cement Association method. The PCA method uh, we use to analyze both loadings, the pallet racking loading and the forklift loads, to figure out which design load would, would control the thickness of the slab. From the analysis, we found out that the pallet racking loads control the thickness of the slab requiring a 13 inch concrete thick slab and this is using a concrete with compressive strength of 5000 psi. The steel that you see in the picture here is the temperature and shrinkage reinforcement. This temperature and shrinkage re reinforcement is used to limit the cracking in the slab. The reinforcement that we use consists of number three grade 60 steel reinforcing bar spaced at 18 inches on center along the length of the slab. And the reinforcement is to be placed with a concrete cover of two inches from the top of the steel to the top of the concrete slab. The next part of the foundation design consists of designing the foundations to hold up the columns and the walls that Joe and Travis analyzed. The type of foundations that we used are shallow spread footings. The Considerations that we took into account for our design are general shear failure, local shear failure, and as well as punching shear failure. And we also considered settlement as well. The method that we used for bearing capacity was the Trizaghi method. This method we used to analyze the size, required size of the footing to not exceed the bearing capacity of the soil. Then we use the size of the footings from that method, and we use the Schmertman method to check and calculate the settlement of all the footings. And the allowable amount of settlement for a typical building like this is usually between one to three inches. We decided to limit the maximum allowable settlement for our building to uh, two, me, two inches. The column footings are designed as square isolated spread footings, and the wall footings are designed as continuous footings. The, all the footings use 5,000 PSI concrete and grade 60 reinforcing steel. The bottom of the footings are placed at three feet below the elevation of the ground surface, and this is to provide protection from freeze thaw of the soil beneath the footings. This diagram here shows the layout of our building, and as Joe mentioned before, we have the building broken up into four different sections. We have section one, which is the main section of the warehouse, section two, which is the loading docks, section three, which is added storage, and then section four, which is the office. And then this diagram down here below shows the concrete shear walls that go along the perimeter of our building. We got a total of 14 concrete shear walls. And for the column footings, they were designed with a thickness of 1.5 feet, and the width of each column footing was based off, based off of the type of column that it was holding up. So out of the diagram that we just showed you, the, the section one for an interior column in section one would use the same size footing for all the columns in that section. And then for the exterior columns in section three, those would also use the same size footing for each one of those columns, so on and so forth. And from the AutoCAD drawing that we have up on the slide, you can see that we have a four and a half by four and a half foot concrete spread footing, and that is supporting a W8 by 31 column. You can see the layout of the green reinforcing steel for flexure, and the purpose of the reinforcing steel is to provide flexure reinforcement 
to resist the moments to vault and the footings due to the column load from the top and the uh, soil pressures from the bottom of the footing. This particular footing uses 180 degree hooks in the steel reinforcement. And that's to provide the appropriate amount of anchorage of the steel in the concrete so that the steel bars can develop the appropriate tension force at the critical section of the column. I'm sorry, the crit critical section of the footing. Column footing. Which for us, for the, the critical section of the column footing is located where the edge of the columns comes in contact with the top of the footing. So about right there. But, um, and then the, uh, the two of the column footings that we designed out of the seven column footings that we designed required the use of 180 degree hooks. The maximum amount of settlement that we had out of all seven of our column footings was 1.8 inches which is less than the maximum allowable settlement of two inches that we set for our building. The wall, the wall footings are designed similar to the column footings as they use the same thickness of 1.5 feet. And we basically had to design four different types of wall footings for the 14 concrete shear walls that we use. And this diagram here shows the layout of a concrete Spread with our, sorry, concrete continuous footing and that's supporting a, our 8 inch concrete shear wall here. <clears throat> and the reinforcement that we used for the concrete footing or for the wall footings, we used grade 60 number 4 steel reinforcing bars. We used the number 4 bars are spaced at 4 inches on center along the length of the strip footing here. And that's the same layout that we use for all of the footings for our wall footings. And this column footing in particular, as well as uses 180 degree hooks in the footing to develop the appropriate amount of anchorage for the reinforcing steel. Only one wall footing used 180 degree hooks in the reinforcing steel, the other three footings did not. And the maximum settlement that we calculated for our wall footings came out to be 0.62 inches, which again is less than the 2 inch maximum allowable settlement that we set for the building. And then the reinforcing steel is placed at a depth D of 14 inches between the top of the footing and the centroid of the reinforcing steel. And the reinforcing steel is to be placed with a concrete cover of 3 inches to protect the steel from corrosion. And that's according to ACI code 31808. Okay, I'm going to briefly talk about loading docks. Um, typical layouts for loading docks are designed to service most vehicles on the road. Um, our design will take into account uh, trailers that will visit the loading dock most frequently. Our door, um, using the dock system guide provided by Blue Giant, we designed the layout. Um, the dock doors were our primary focus. Um, improperly sized doors can create logistics headaches and reduce efficiency. So we size our doors based on the size of trailers uh, that, that we see most frequently. Uh, most trailers are 8 feet wide and a 10 feet height was used to increase floor to, uh, floor to ceiling loading of the products. And the door height from the pavement, a four feet has been selected to accommodate any vehicle. Apron space is basically defined as the amount of space from, as you can see, the docking area here, we provided two times the total truck length to allow our trucks to get around already docked trucks. So we provided 180 feet of apron space to allow these trucks to get out and to allow them to maneuver and position uh, to the docking area. We formed a cost analysis for construction, materials, and labor. Um, we used the RS means building construction cost data um, to get our values and we estimated total cost of the product including services and construction, labor and materials, and engineering services at $78 million 
which is within our budget. And in closing, uh, this is the software that we used for drawing up our uh, distribution center and for analyzing the shear walls. We use Autodesk Revit structures as well as AutoCAD Simple 3D to do the drawings. And as Travis mentioned, he used the analysis, the, excuse me, visual analysis shear walls for the shear wall design. And we would like to thank those who helped us with the design of our distribution center. I would like to thank Brad Stump, the Cal County Surveyor, for providing us with the AutoCAD files and the hard copies of the contours on our project site. I would like to thank Professor T.J. Murphy for assisting us with the site development as well as the stormwater management. Dr. Will Lindquist, who helped us with the structure design. And Dr. Tim Tyler, who helped us with the foundation design. And lastly, we would like to thank the Tron University IT desk for providing us with the software that we use. And here's a list of references that, and resources that we use. The, res, the resources that we used uh, range from the textbooks that we use in our design classes here at Trinity University to the codes and standards that are adopted by the local, local municipalities here in this region. And we thank you for your attention and have any questions. Megan. Yes, Jill. The uh, hydrographs you use yes. to calculate how much volume uh, you're going to need in your ponds. How did you actually figure that out? Because the post development or the the post post development inflow or the outflow. The outflow. The outflow. Yeah. Well, we use the post development, the volume underneath, well, the area underneath the curve, which is a feet cubed, so technically the volume. And we use that. And we were able to use a spreadsheet based off the MACE book. We used the equations of MACE book. And we used, determined that we wanted a riser pipe structure. We had to assume a diameter first for the riser pipe structure. And we had to also take into account for, um, yeah, take into account for the, the volume and the riser pipe structure. And if it didn't, because the first time we tried it, the outflow hydrograph curve was greater than the pre-development inflow hydrograph curve, so then we had to make our volume bigger for our pond and our riser pipe structure bigger. Okay. Question about the columns. Okay. Were they all the same design? You showed one one design. Yes, we we pretty much uh, designed a spreadsheet that had all the built in uh, calculations. Or equations, and we have different different heights uh, depending on which section we're looking at. So we assume boiler theory for all of the columns, and we took an account of the critical buffering modes, the designer columns using but, that. But they were different column sizes. Okay, yeah, so you just showed us one. Yeah, this is just for section one. Okay. Yeah, we have a total of uh, at least six different. Yeah. In, for section one, the interior is different from the exterior columns, and then uh, the other sections are different as well. Right. This, this, these columns that we had in the slideshow were uh, the interior for section one, which is going to support the largest columns. So this is going to be the largest size columns. And then for the office, we're going to be using like 8531s. What kind of in conditions and breaking conditions? Uh, concrete will be cast around the columns, we're going to have a fixed base, and then we're going to have a pin connection to the top. So, our effective length cap, or effective length factor was like 20. Any bracing? No bracing, we were standing on the columns. So we can go drive by this building if we head towards Fort Wayne. How does your design differ from the building that happens to stand uh, very near the interstate uh, as you drive by. Is it very different? Well, Is it similar? Based, um, based on the information that the uh, Family Dollar Group gave us, uh, we have no idea because they would not give us anything. We emailed them when we first started this project and asked for simple dimensions of the building footprint and they would not even give us that. They said that uh, if we were to do this design, we would understand their design too much 
and therefore they did not want to assist us in any way. Although they firmly believe in educational resource output, but they would not help us in any way. So, to actually, the way we got the dimensions for our building is we clipped out the newspaper article that said the building was going to be 815,000 square feet. So we averaged that. We went to their family dollar site in Florida, which is the exact same design footprint, and I actually measured it with the measuring tool on Google Earth and measured the outline of every side of the building and then scaled it to equal 815,000 square feet. And then we adjusted the lengths to be regular sizes that weren't really big decimal points. So, yeah. So we have no idea what their design is. It was all our own design. From a stormwater uh, standpoint, the DeKalb County Surveyor actually showed me that they're using towel drains within the site and outside the site. And instead of us using towel drains, we're using pipes. So that's the only thing they gave us. Yeah. Uh, just a few questions for everybody, I think. Um, very good. I like how you could uh, give your presentation without being tied down to any kind of card or anything. You just seem to really know what you did over the past two years. And you re recognize what you did, so I appreciate that. Uh, a couple of things, the pavement section, did you say this was all asphalt? Uh, the front parking lot is concrete, the back parking lot is asphalt, the main entrance is asphalt as well. Okay. Any in the car parking area, any permeable pavement uh, ideas? We just, for when we did our runoff coefficients, we just, in the book, just assumed basic concrete for the stormwater runoff, so. Okay, okay. Uh, as far as the span, you have some long spans of 160 left. How did you determine the span? Was it arbitrary or did you have a reason? We, we based it on uh, our design load calculations. We were able to, um, the Bullcraft manual that we have that we selected our member from is in uh, pounds per foot. And uh, we were able to t take our design load and put it into a pounds per foot and calculate it. And, measure it off of their manual and we can select a span based on what we were getting and what they had. So we basically typed in a span and said this is, if our span is this, this is where our maximum loading is going to be, will that uh, be okay for this span in their manual? Okay. So that's how we picked it. You're fairly limited to the spans that are provided in that manual from Bullcraft as well as you're also limited by the um, amount of the strength that they had as well. So that was pretty much the largest section that we could use. They go all the way up to, I believe, around 180 feet or so. So we were focusing on that. We tried to get the biggest open spaces we could, being as the distribution center. So what we tried at first is having no interior columns, and that would not work because our span would be 495 feet. So our span in between each column ended up being 165 feet. Okay, uh, and I'm kind of a dirt kind of guy, so I had more questions in that area. You showed a boring log or something up there. Yes. How did you get those end values, and how did you, did you correlate all this, or where did you actually get the sort of thing? We just used the soil, soil boring data from uh, from sim similar regions, from past foundation homeworks to come up, kind of come up with end values for those soil uh, layers, and then we use uh, we use those end values to determine the rest of the many uh, soil properties. Okay, and probably the most important thing is your settlement criteria, two inch settlement, total settlement. Yes. How did you come up with that? Uh, using the uh, foundation book written by Coduto, he we use the a lot maximum allowable settlements that he lays out in those. Uh, in his book there, and the uh, maximum allowable amount of settlement for uh, typical buildings such as this range from one to three inches, and it's usually around uh, the maximum settlement of one inch for a typical office building. And since we were kind of somewhere, we weren't completely in just an industrial building, we were also we were a little bit more than that, so we decided to just limit the maximum allowable settlement to two inches. Okay, column put in for mostly four foot by four. 
those they vary a lot. They vary. The largest footing that we had was a nine foot by nine foot spread footing, and the smallest column footing was a four foot by four foot footing. Why did you choose to use a ten year storm for your design? <laughs> um, because based on our time of concentrations, we were in our classes or more. Um, well, that's a good question. That's what we used. We, we were using the Fort Wayne stormwater standards for the site development and the stormwater management, and that's what they specify to use in their uh, site standards. And what duration started to use to, for designing the ponds? Ten year. For the duration, not the return period, the duration. Was that specified in the manual? No. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? No, that's time for the discussion.